Yeah, so my name's Tom. Uh, I'm the chair of Visa PGN. Um, we um, would normally do this event, uh, as Juliet mentioned, at the annual conference, um, the Visa annual conference, which we didn't get to do this year. Um, normally, this would be an event where participants submit a paper um, that they've written um, to be read by various journal editors and get personalised feedback. Um, obviously, the format this time is a bit different, um, so we're trying something a bit different. Um, this is good because it's um, it's much more accessible and um, and I think we can kind of help a lot more people uh, through a format like this. Um, so what I'm going to do, kind of largely in keeping with the way that we've been doing these PGN events so far, is we've got six um, editors who've very kindly joined us today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I will hand over to them uh, in order um, as listed on the um, on the event page. Um, they will speak for five or ten minutes um, and then we will open up to a kind of general um, uh, Q&A session um, and yeah as Chrissy said just if you could keep yourselves muted and then um, use the raise hand function we, we will bring you into the into the conversation and we'll we'll prompt you um, when to unmute and speak um, during the Q&A. So we're going to go through um, in order. So we're going to start off with Ambreen Amanji from African Affairs. Um, we'll then go to Victoria Basham, who's here from Critical uh, Military Studies. Oh, sorry, I'm just full screening myself. I need to do that. Then we've got uh, Ted Newman, who's representing uh, European Journal of International Security, EJIS. Andrew Dorman is here from Chatham House and also International Affairs. Emily Taylor is here from Journal of Cyber Policy and Martin Coward is here from the Review of International Studies. So we've got a really nice um, spread um, hopefully there is something there that everybody um, can find useful. So um, without further ado, I think that's everything. So um, Ambrina, if you're happy to, um, to kick us off um, and say a little sure. bit about African affairs, sure. that would be great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to, to be here on behalf of African Affairs. Um, I'm going to start just by saying something um, about the, the journal and, and where we um, sit in the kind of constellation of journals that are, that are here today, and then a, um, a little bit about our various um, submissions um, and the way that you might want to approach uh, submissions to us. So um, African Affairs is really one of the, the, the more established um, journals in the arena of kind of Africanist journals. Um, and it's considered um, very much one of the, the leading African studies journals. Um, it, it publishes largely in the fields of, of politics and inter, international relations as they relate to sub-Saharan Africa. And for the most part, it's um, interdisciplinary in its, in its approach. Um, so it will publish papers in sociology, in anthropology, in economics, in law, uh, and it will publish in on um, topics such as history, art, literature, music, etc. So long as they inform debates about contemporary Africa. So that's important to say. Um, and it's really important if you're thinking of submitting to us that you have a look at the aims and mission of the journal and that you do that either in a hard copy in the library or online and just make sure that you understand the um, the way in which the journal sees itself and the sorts of papers that it's interested in. So one good way to do that, for example, is to look at our um, website where you'll find open access pieces organised under kind of uh, reading lists under different topics. So, for example, we're preparing one on land. There's a very comprehensive one there on gender in Africa. And those papers will give you a very good sense of the sorts of things that we're interested in publishing. Now, the reason that's important is that quite a large number of our submissions are rejected, for, and I think other um, editors will tell you this, for reasons of fit. <coughs> in other words, it's often nothing to do with the quality of the paper. It's a very good quality paper. It just doesn't speak to our readership. It's too narrow, perhaps. Um, it could be too historical. It might be much better um, submitted to a literary studies journal. So, and that's, that's a, a shame for the author because obviously it's demoralizing for that to happen, but it's very often it's because um, our authors haven't really looked at the fit 
of, for their paper with the journal. And I'll come on to a little bit more about that in a minute. Let me say what sorts of submissions we, we take. Um, first, like, like every journal, most of our papers are published articles. Um, and in relation to that, it's really important, I think, to pay attention to our mission and aims, as I say, but also to what, what it is we're looking for in the papers that we publish. Predominantly, we're looking for originality. So what you want to show in your submission, in your, in your writing, is that either you're generating new empirical data in some way. So, for example, you're showing us for the first time a very systematic study of archives or of newspaper reports or of government reports, or you're basing your paper on surveys or on um, interviews, for example. And, and that, that empirical element is what makes your paper stand out as original and new. Alternatively, or as, as well, we would be looking for papers that advance a very particular distinctive uh, theoretical approach or conceptual approach. So what are you saying that's new? What's new in your analysis and argument is what we'd be looking for. And it's really important to say that what needs to be done by authors in advance of, of submitting to us is, is the groundwork to make sure all of those um, considerations have been thoroughly gone through. So I think what happens a lot with, with, with our submissions to journals is that we're, we're so busy with our eyes down on the paper itself that sometimes we don't raise our eyes and look at the kind of the landscape ahead of us, the path ahead of us, and say, well, is this the right journal for me, for this piece of work? The piece of work in itself, of course, you know, you know you've got to make it outstanding, you know you've got to make it as good as you possibly can. But the, the, the work before that, the kind of pre-work to a submission is what's, what journal fits me? What, what, where, are my, where are my readers? Where do I really want to make an interesting intervention? And to do that, you really have to know the journal you're submitting to. And there are various ways of doing that. You can, of course, and you should look online and look at our papers and see if, for example, you might be able to place your paper as intervening in a, a debate that we've already run in our journal. Is there a kind of long-standing discussion debate in, um, amongst African fairs? papers that you could make an intervention in or that you could critique or see differently or add to in some way but also importantly talk to people who've published with us so talk i think this is really important talk to people who you know have published with us and say what was your experience like um i have this paper could you have a chat to me about whether it's a good fit for african affairs um for early career scholars talk to mentors supervisors um, people in your institutions who might have have something to do with the journal have published there before so that you're doing a little bit of homework about where it is you're sending your paper into and that really goes to the question of does your paper fit because as I say a lot of our submissions really are rejected at the kind of desk stage before we send them out to review for lack of fit and, and, and I think it's important to stress this that you know reviewers particularly at the, at the moment are under enormous pressure and journals are reluctant to use up the time and goodwill of, of reviewers unless they really think a paper could fit in the journal. If at, at our, our very careful reading as editors we find look, there isn't going to be a fit here, we probably wouldn't send it out to review. So that's important to do that pre-work, if you like, before you submit. Um, so do have a read and do your homework and look at our, our website. It's actually ex exceptionally comprehensive. Think also about, um, about the style in which you're writing, because you've got to remember that it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the name tells you something about the journal. Um, it's called African Affairs and it is effectively a, a generalist sort of journal. So um, it, it, what we need is a kind of accessible style that will communicate and speak to a reasonably broad readership in the round. Um, and you need to signpost and help that readership through your paper. So if it's particularly specialized, if it's speaking to a very particular kind of audience, you know, linguistics or literary theory, 
think about whether you need to modify it so that it speaks to a more general, um, very well informed, but generalist readership. Um, and it may be that you have to do some work in advance of submitting to make sure that that, that stylistically, it, 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 it fits with the kind of reader that you're hoping to, to reach with African affairs. So I've talked about papers. The, the articles, those are the main submissions that we have, and you can look at really good examples of this, and I would really urge you to actually look at um, existing published pay articles before you submit to us. We also have um, a couple of other ways that you could submit to us that are a way of dipping your toe in, if you like, into the journal, particularly if you're at an early career stage, these are useful to know about. Um, so the first is, is our research notes. So these are um, reasonably new um, innovations. They're short pieces. They're designed really to um, make an intervention on interesting methodological or ethical issues in African studies. So they're papers of about four or five thousand words. Um, and the idea is that they, they make an interesting intervention, these research notes, on kind of debates in research methods. So if you think you have uh, work um, that, that raises interesting methodological issues or you have something that you think you can write that will speak to a broad African studies audience, that might be an interesting way of dipping a toe in. These are short pieces, four or five thousand words, and they're not refereed. So they're really quite a, a good way of making a start, particularly when you've just come out of field work and you have interesting, you're close to your thinking about methodology and you're, you have interesting things to say, may have interesting things to say on that. These are a nice way of, of get, getting to know the journal and, and for the journal editors get, to get to know you. Um, and those research notes, as I say, are, are short and not refereed. So they, they have their place, I think, um, for, for, for young scholars in um, getting started in, with us. I'd say there that it's interesting and useful to contact us if you have a, an idea in mind because we'll talk to you about whether we've had something like this in the past, whether the idea you have uh, might be of interest so that you, you're opening the discussion with us before you do any substantive work. So that's the first short form um, way of, of approaching the journal. The other, the second uh, way of perhaps getting published to the journalists through our briefings. So again, it's worth contacting us on these, but they're short pieces and we can talk to you in advance about whether the topic you have is, it might be of interest. They're about 4,000 words long. And what we, we envisage with these pieces, the briefings, is that the, um, the topic they cover will be an issue of some kind of contemporary importance to African politics and international relations. And again, they'll have a broad, audience so what we're looking for is new insights um, on a particular topic so for example a forthcoming election or a previous one uh, and an, an, an event that you think might be interesting uh, that you you could give a new and interesting interpretation to so these are not full research papers um, so, so there's less need less demand for um, originality as such they're not a full um, fledged article, but you do have to have something catchy to say. So those are, those are three ways in which we would hope that our, our readers, our writers would, um, would intervene in, in, in the journal. First, a full length um, academic article, and actually, as established academics, we're better at talking um, to, to early career colleagues about those. Um, but there are other things that you should also explore. And I think our briefings and our research notes are really interesting ways that you might be able to make interventions. And I would also say that there are three editors of the journal. Um, and we are, I think, fairly approachable bunch. So if there were things that you were thinking of submitting, I think we'd be open to talking to you about those. But also, and I'll just make this fun, final point, do do the research in advance and talk to people who know us as a journal because we're long established. Um, lots of academics out there know the sort of work that we publish and would be able to guide you on whether your research as, as it's currently um, written up might be of interest. They might be able to advise you about changing the, the, the emphasis and changing the way in which the paper approaches things in order to make yourself more um, attractive to, to African affairs. I hope that's been useful. 
That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Ambrita. Um, that was incredibly helpful. Um, I certainly have um, a question or two for you uh, during the Q&A session, so that, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great way to kick us off. Um, so uh, I will hand over to our second editor who's joining us today, um, which is uh, Victoria Basham, who uh, is here representing critical military studies. Um, she was also going to be the keynote speaker at our PGN conference, which we unfortunately um, had to cancel, um, but uh, it's good to have her here. So um, I'll hand over to you, Victoria, if you're ready to go. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, um, everyone at Beza and Chatham House for having uh, Delighted to be here. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm off screen when I'm not speaking. That's because my bandwidth has been a bit dodgy. So I'm really hoping I'm not going to disappear mid sentence. Um, so I'll, I'll be on for now because it's nice to be able to address people and sort of get them to be able to see me. But uh, the rest of the time I'll be a black screen. So apologies. Um, Critical Military Studies is just five years old. We're a very uh, new kid on the block, as it were, as journals go. This is our fifth year of publishing. Um, we're an interdisciplinary and indeed, I think, transdisciplinary journal. So we publish both uh, papers which um, speak from particular disciplinary uh, stances, but also ones which transcend disciplinary stances and perhaps um, draw on elements of multidisciplinary um, methods, techniques, theories, uh, and so on. Um, we um, are very much concerned with uh, crit uh, critical engagement with military power. That's not just uh, militaries um, specifically, although we do uh, publish a lot on, on sort of state militaries and so forth, but on militarism, militarization, and we're also particularly interested in sites of um, kind of martial politics, as Alison Howes put it in a recent paper in the International Feminist Journal of Politics, and kind of sites which perhaps um, aren't necessarily normally um, so kind of easily recognisable as having some military character, but, but in fact are infused with those kinds of power relations. Um, we primarily, uh, much like um, Ambrina was talking about with internet affairs publish uh, research original research articles but we also have some other um, elements to the journal um, the main thing um, that we have a section called encounters and this arises from being a trans slash kind of interdisciplinary journal in that we have quite a lot of engagement with um, those using artistic methods, uh, things like poetry, um, songwriting, um, observational work in museums, uh, photojournalism, these kinds of things. And so the encounters section, which is a non-peer reviewed aspect of the journal is sort of um, short pieces uh, that are equivalent of 2000 words. Sometimes they have less because they have photos and or uh, artworks or whatever they might be but it's just a way of us kind of um, having a space for um, different encounters critical encounters with the military as it were so that's quite an exciting um, aspect of the journal um, the other th uh, thing that we do which some journals do and some journals don't is that we um, encourage and invite submissions for special issues um, and in the past we have um, had special issues both that have been guest edited by you know senior academics with long track records but also fairly early career uh, academics who are working on, in an, a topic area and have found themselves as part of a community where they have this really rich exciting set of debates that they want to kind of bring to our readers that um, transcend a single article and we're very proud to have been and able to be a space for special issues as well as original articles and pieces. And we would very much encourage um, postgraduates, early career scholars, and scholars at any stage of their career to think about uh, coming to us with ideas for special as well as um, with papers, because we're, we're kind of keen to, to develop our understanding of different kinds of um, aspects of the, the broad uh, debate around critical military studies. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on uh, is expanding our editorial board. Uh, critical military studies, sorry, as a subfield, um, grew up 
uh, primarily, I think, uh, through some of the frustrations of primarily UK-based uh, academics, but with lots of contacts to others. And what we're finding, um, what we found initially were lots of scholars who were sort of in different sort of disciplines who very much felt on the kind of periphery of their disciplines and didn't necessarily have other people in their immediate environments to discuss these matters with. And we've realised, of course, um, that these people are located all around the globe. And um, the journal, one of the nicest things, um, most encouraging things about the journal is it's read all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, for a young journal, I'm told that's fairly unusual. So um, we're sort of expanding our editorial board and we're hoping we're going to bring more and more spotlights on militarized practices and military practices and power around the globe and in different regions that are maybe less familiar to, to readers at present. Um, we're also um, very, uh, as well as being very keen to sort of hear from early career researchers, an initiative that we're launching in um, sort of around September time this year is that one of our associate editors has very kindly agreed to a very established academic who's got a lot of experience with editing and, and writing has agreed to act as our kind of early career researcher sounding board. Um, so she'll be kind of coming into that post as I say later on this year. And the idea being that we get a lot of um, interesting pieces that come through but often get desk rejected because they are not yet as fully developed as they ought to be. Um, they're perhaps maybe chapters from PhDs rather than fully formed articles or maybe even just theses we sometimes get um, and they're not kind of they don't have that kind of special tight-knit focus that we would expect from a journal article but instead of um, you know just we always try to um, work hard to kind of send constructive feedback to prospective authors but we felt that this was such an important area and so important to kind of develop um, early career researchers and, and uh, engagement with journal that we decided it needed a, a whole person really to, to kind of take this on as a particular role so we're really excited that one of our associate editors has agreed to spearhead that initiative um, and linked to that we'd always say if you've got an idea paper um, or if you've got an abstract or you've got a paper but you're not quite sure do always email us um, our, our details are available on the journal's website um, and you can email me at my normal Cardiff address or you you know we have a, a journal an editor at critical military studies .org, um, email address and you're very very welcome to get in touch and sort of sound us out um, and just to echo some of the things that Ambrina was saying about you know um, the journal and the sort of suitability. So the other reason that we desk reject, um, other than pieces not being, you know, tightly focused enough for us at that point, um, will be if they don't meet as, you know, in a sort of significant, meaningful way, our, our scope, scope and aims. And often um, we get pieces that will meet the scope of the journal. Um, the kind of, we have a broad scope of things that we're interested in and they're all listed on our website, but often pieces won't meet our aims. So for example, we're, as a critical um, journal, we're not terribly interested in pieces that, uh, you know, exist to make military, state militaries more efficient. There are lots of journals that publish that kind of work and often we get very high quality work that is um, informing the debate and helping state armed forces in particular to kind of um, do something better and make their them more militarily efficient but that's not what our aim is as a journal um, so do read uh, the aims closely think about it sound us out and as Ambrina said you know talk to people um, if they're in your networks or reach out to them um, who, who have published in the journal and do read the pieces in the journal because the key thing for us um, editors and I'm sure this applies to other editors and they'll tell you similar is that we we have a responsibility both to prospective authors and to our readers um, and one of the key things in that exchange of ideas is will our readers um, appreciate this and engage with it um, because a we want to satisfy them and, and you know encourage them to keep reading the journal and engaging with it but very importantly will our prospective authors get the engagement that their work deserves and the work isn't a good fit for us we will tell you that um, not least because we don't want to sort of uh, you to end up putting your work in a place that doesn't benefit you because you won't get the kind of meaningful engagement that your work deserves um, and so often we'll, we'll suggest alternatives in those cases so it's well worth doing that homework and, and making sure that the, the journal's a good fit for you because ultimately you want the most uh, you know intelligent insightful audience to be engaging with your work and and you know um, at, at scale as it were. 
Um, and uh, just a piece, a short kind of note about um, one of the other things that uh, sometimes happens with a sort of less developed paper, as well as not perhaps being written as a tightly focused um, journal article, which essentially means, you know, you've got to have one kind of clear overarching idea, you've only got a certain amount of words, you're trying to get, you know, a it's a self-contained piece of work, it's not like a PhD, which has all these different building blocks and lots of different elements to it, it, it has to be, you know, much more kind of concise and to the point. Um, but as part of that, it's really, really important to centre the contribution that you're seeking to make and make it clear who your interlocutors are. So, you know, um, you, you need to be showing that you're talking to the wide journal readership, but there might be an aspect of the kind of sort of series of debates that the journal is interested in and you're sort of zooming in on that. And that's fine often, but you need to be clear you know how you're zooming in on that and why and, and what you're doing to develop it um, and so just being really clear and upfront about those things often helps a paper to catch the eye it's often uh, more, more relatable and it's often something that reviewers can kind of get their teeth into in a, in a more constructive kind of way if they have to go digging um, for the contribution then you know sometimes they send end, angry emails to editors or um, or they're you know confused and they, they don't perhaps offer quite the feedback that, that might be as valuable so do try and center the contribution uh, that you're making and how you're addressing the journal's readers in, in fairly particular uh, kind of terms. And I think um, just linked to that, one of the issues that often arises around that is a sort of underselling of one's work. Um, so it's important not to oversell and build up straw men and claim, you know, you've, that no one's ever looked at some topic before when they have. But equally, it's important not to um, kind of lose sight of your own voice and, and, to de and not to decenter your voice. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's something, imposter syndrome never goes away, I think it's fair to say. Um, but, you know, when you're an early career researcher, and particularly when you're competing uh, in an environment that's incredibly competitive and, and difficult, at times one can feel a bit sort of um, like they're not sure what their contribution is. But make that sing and journal editors and reviewers will love to hear that and, and will appreciate that and get excited by your work. Thank you. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you, Victoria. That's brilliant and nice to uh, finish up on an uplifting note there as well. Um, nice corrective to, to uh, how things are going. So that, that's great. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, I'm going to bring in um, Ted Newman next from the European Journal of International Security. So Ted, if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to take it away. Great. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Excellent. So um, thank you for organising this. It's, it's great to be a part of it. I'm very happy to represent and speak about the European Journal of International Security, uh, which is, of course, a BISA journal. And I co-edit this with uh, Jason Ralph, my colleague here in Leeds, and also Jackie True, who is at uh, Monash University in uh, Australia. We're quite a large editorial team, and this journal is now organized and run very much as a team effort. So I do want to just mention a few names um, of uh, our larger editorial team. So we newly appointed three regional editors uh, who are Karin Agistam from Lund University, in Sweden, um, Navnita Behera from the University of Delhi, and Jennifer Mitson from uh, Ohio University. We also have five very active associate editors, uh, all based here in Leeds, who are Laura Considine, Jack Holland, uh, Yoshi Kobayashi, Nick Robinson, and Christina uh, Stefan. Um, all of us based here at Leeds are associated with our new Centre for Global Security Challenges. This is quite a large international editorial team. It reflects a, a diverse range of backgrounds and interests. And it also provides geographic and gender balance. And I think all of this might give you a hint at the kind of guidance that we intend to uh, um, bring to the journal over the next three and a half 
or so years. This large active team will also help us to reach out and uh, engage with our uh, community, if you like, including BISA, um, especially when and if uh, things get back to normal. So we had um, a series of events, mainly at conferences around the world, planned for this year uh, to, to um, relaunch the journal, if you like, under this new editorial team. Uh, but of course, um, none of that is going to happen. Um, so we're quite a new editorial team, um, and this is also quite a, a new journal, uh, first published in 2016, with two issues per year, uh, which increased to three in 2018, and we will soon move to four issues uh, per year. We set out our vision for the journal in our editorial in issue one of this year when we took over. And in that statement, we, um, we, we wrote that we would like EJIS to continue to be an, an inclusive, um, if you like a pluralistic journal with an emphasis obviously upon rigor, whether that's theoretical or empirical analysis, a journal that's broadly critical, but, but not in a prescriptive sense. Um, we're open to submissions that engage in security studies from a, a broad range of theoretical and methodological perspectives uh, and also empirical topics, uh, as well as to submissions that are global, or indeed focusing on specific regions or countries of the world. And just in case there's any misunderstanding, although we are the European Journal of International Security, we certainly don't just publish material on security debates about Europe. Uh, we're very much global in scope. So theoretically, I think we want to push the boundaries of debates about contested ideas of, of security uh, and engage in, in the theoretical uh, themes um, of the day, but we're also very keen to publish more empirically oriented work uh, as long as it speaks to the concepts of security, um, however defined. So there's no rigid editorial uh, agenda um, apart from rigor and originality, and, and certainly not uh, an exclusive agenda. And I think this is appropriate for an uh, association journal. Uh, nevertheless, there are some themes that we are committed to, uh, and we talk about in our inaugural editorial uh, published earlier this year. So we would like the journal to be globally engaged and inclusive in terms of who publishes in the journal, uh, the substance of the papers that we publish, uh, as well as their theoretical scope. So we, we acknowledge that IR gen journals in general um, have a gender gap, uh, and they also perform quite poorly when it comes to including scholars from the global south. Uh, and we want to address this imbalance not only because inclusivity is important, but because it enhances the field, uh, uh, enhances debates about security. Um, so we're working through plans now to engage better with scholars based in the global south, uh, to increase the number of submissions and papers published uh, from women, and also to better support early career researchers. Um, I suppose global engagement and in inclusivity is for us uh, a part of a broader movement to uh, reflect the post-colonial, post-Western shift in, in IR uh, and addressing blind spots and silences in security studies. And, and we're quite keen to to support those sorts of uh, debates. Uh, at the same time, we are a part of a European 
tradition in security studies uh, and we very much remain open to that uh, around debates um, on securitization, armed conflict, uh, war and peace and pretty much everything in between. Um, interdisciplinarity is something we're, we're very keen to support and, uh, and also we've been publishing quite a bit in, in uh, new technologies and data science and, and considering how these uh, developments are, are transforming security studies and the security agenda and um, methodologies of understanding security challenges. Um, so in terms of um, submissions, um, I would say apart from uh, rigor and, and significance and uh, originality, uh, we quite like submissions which, which speak to uh, ongoing debates and uh, make a very clear contribution uh, and, and try to move these debates forward. Um, but at the same time, we don't see the existing debates uh, as being defining and certainly not as uh, establishing parameters uh, for what we, we publish. Um, as I said, we're very open to empirical research and uh, you'll see that we publish quite a lot uh, of empirical stuff, but I would encourage people to, to link empirical studies to, to broader themes or broader debates in security studies. So, for example, an empirical study on, I don't know, uh, the foreign policy of a certain country or um, peacekeeping or something like that, just because it inherently seems to address a topic that we would consider to be a, a security topic. We, authors shouldn't necessarily take that as a given. Uh, we, we want people to engage with uh, security as, as a contested uh, subject, if you like. Um, we're now uh, in the midst, if you like, of, of um, drawing up uh, an agenda um, for, for engaging with potential authors, um, but we haven't got around to publishing that yet. But when we do, we um, have a few initiatives, and I'll touch upon some of those um, now. Uh, firstly, uh, we want people to consider reaching out to us and, and to maybe make a, a pitch um, for an article or indeed send a manuscript to us informally uh, if you're not sure about the fit and we can provide feedback um, on it. In addition, uh, and I, I think that, that you heard this from previous speakers and, and we want to do the same thing, um, we want to give some substantive feedback on submissions which we feel have real potential, but they're not quite ready to send out for uh, a full review uh, and where more work is, is necessary. So this is instead of a, a straight desk rejection. And uh, we hope it will be particularly helpful to early career um, researchers. Of course, we will still be desk rejecting some submissions, but we're really committed to giving substantive feedback even when we're giving a, a straight desk rejection. Uh, we have quite a large editorial team who are very much engaged and very active. And so um, I think this is how we're able to, to give this kind of support and provide this kind of uh, engagement. So, for example, if BISA had been running now, okay, uh, we would have been um, not just involved in the meeting the editor's feedback session, but we had planned uh, to meet with potential authors to give feedback. Um, 
We're also moving to a format free submissions policy in terms of references uh, in line with a number of other um, journals. Okay, that's all from me for now. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Ted. That's brilliant. Um, um, yeah, that's a great introduction to, uh, to EJIS. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to hand over now to, uh, to Andrew, who we've heard from briefly before, um, who is here with International Affairs. So, Andrew, if you'd like to take the mic. Is Andrew still here? Are we still hanging? Oh, yeah. You hear me? Good. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I'm part of the editorial team for International Affairs. International Affairs, as some of you may know, is one of the oldest journals in the field. We are currently in our 98th year, so we've had a, a great range of some of the newer journals, but we're one of the oldest in the field. Um, and we're the house journal of Chatham House. We're published by Oxford University Press, and we produce on six editions per year. Um, most of our pieces are non traditional academic pieces and our readership is a mixture of both academics and practitioners. So as uh, some of the other speakers have men mentioned, when writing for us, uh, as our audience is both academic and practitioner, you need to make sure any pieces you submit to us speak to both those audiences. Um, pieces that only speak to one or either one half or the other half just don't work for us. You need to talk to our whole readership. I said the journal's been going for, uh, for 98 years. It covers the whole of the discipline. Traditionally, it's been a qualitative journal. We are taking more quantitative pieces on, but um, if you are submitting a quantitative type piece, please bear in mind, most of our readership is not mathematically literate. So when using quantitative data, which is great, you need to make sure you write it for people who aren't that good at maths and are not very familiar with statistics. So we're happy to look at quantitative pieces, but just make sure they're written for those of us who are less numerate than you, you may be yourselves. Um, in terms of um, our links to the field, we are doing a number of initiatives at the moment. Currently running is what's known as our 50-50 initiative. Um, came out of an idea from Ruth Blakely of Visa. So this year we're looking for all our pieces that are published, whether it's an article, whether it's a, um, a, a blog or whatever, we're looking for half our pieces to be by um, women to see what actually it would look like for our journals if half our pieces were actually from female based female academics. Um, so we're going to see how that looks um, and we're glad to see we've had lots of submissions from, from women in that respect. We've also got an early career diversity initiative aimed particularly at the Global South to try and encourage and support those who are coming and struggling with resources they've got and want to get into the top journals and we've got that initiative going as well. Um, I'm aware of time. Some pointers I would suggest and I think that the, the general rather than for specifically for international affairs, um, um, easy mistakes people make and most of these mistakes I have made when I've tried to submit to journals so if you make any of them don't feel you're alone I did it myself um, as others have said firstly make sure you look to make some form of original contribution you know what are you ultimately saying um, too many articles I read at the conclusion is we need more research it's not actually a conclusion just we need more research there needs to be something there what is your contribution put it another way is Tell us what, what is the, the answer to the so what question. Uh, what, what one point can you take from your article that readers need to take? Second thing I think you need to bear in mind is to bear in mind the readership of that journal. Um, focus and research the journals um, to see what they're looking for. Third thing um, is bear in mind what has that journal already covered on that subject. I remember one author once said to me, you can never have enough pieces written on NATO. International Affairs has written a lot on NATO and it will write more on it, have more, publish more pieces on NATO in the future. But you can have enough pieces on NATO. It's got to be something new. Four, we all have author guidelines. Most of us are waving the, the style -like side at the moment. But bear in mind things like word length. For International Affairs, we look for pieces of seven to 9,000 words, including footnotes. So if you submit a 15,000 word piece, it's just not going to be, it's just going to be desk rejected. So look to see what the guidelines say. Make sure you submit that fit those. Fifth, 
we're all editors, we're all human, we're happy to take questions. If you're not sure, send us an email, contact us. If you think you think your piece may fit, ask us. We're all happy to respond uh, and talk to you about these things. Six, titles. Um, when you're thinking, most academics come up with fantastic titles that have no relationship whatsoever to the piece they write on. My advice is to think of it as a Google uh, Scholar search. I once had a piece published called "More Than a Storm in a, More Than a Storm in a Teacup." Would you have known that was about Scottish independence and the impact of that would have on defence? No. Think of it in terms of Google Scholar. If you want your piece picked up, it's got to be easily searchable. A seventh, if your piece is accepted, that's fantastic, but that's not the end. Work with the editorial team, work with your institution, use your own networks to, to market your piece. One of the challenges we all have as, as scholars is we have too much information and too many things to read. So you've got, if your piece is accepted, you've got to get compete to get your piece in front of people and get them to read it. So work with the teams, look at what you can do. You know, in terms of social networks, your institution and so forth. Eight, before you submit, get others to read your piece and critique it. Um, make sure they're honest. Get, the more you can get people to read your piece before you submit it, the better it will be. Uh, nine, I'm afraid rejection is quite a norm in this business that we live in. Most of the top journals are rejecting more than 90% of the pieces submitted to them. So rejection is a norm and we have to get on with it but most pieces will ultimately get accepted somewhere. So look at the feedback you get if you get rejected. You know, put it aside, look at it in the cold light of day, read it and then transfer, take it on board and submit somewhere else. And finally, a plea. Um, we all, most of us look for three review, to try and get three reviews for every piece that we, we put out for review. For everything you submit, please ag agree to be a reviewer three times. Trying to get a review, particularly at the moment, is a nightmare, and it's a real challenge for us all. It's a freebie good that, as a profession, we give to each other. So if I could encourage you all, please agree to be reviewers for a piece that is that's applicable to what you do. We all understand that as editors, at times, people are just too busy. But you know, to, to make the whole reviewing process work, we do need help from you guys as well. Many thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. That's great. Um, and that's a list of really uh, important, um, concise points for people to uh, to consider um, when submitting. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Emily Taylor, um, who's here from the Journal of Cyber Policy. Um, thanks, Emily. Thank you very much, Tom. And um, I'm the second Chatham House uh, journal speaking in a row. Um, I'm not going to repeat the excellent points made by other speakers on this. I'm just going to give a, a brief description of our journal and then a, a few top tips for early career researchers. So the Journal of Cyber Policy is a Chatham House peer-reviewed journal published by Routledge, Taylor and Francis. And um, unlike international affairs, we've only been going for four, five years. This is our fifth year, rather. We were launched in 2016. And we wanted to provide a unique space for scholars, practitioners to address emerging issues relating to cyber policy challenges. Um, so uh, just a few rattle through a few stats about the journal we're now one of Taylor and Francis's fastest growing titles and to date we've had more than uh, 210,000 article downloads uh, our audience is international 38% uh, of our downloads originate from outside Europe and North America and external engagement with the journal is on the rise. Uh, so a couple of other speakers have mentioned the importance of social media. Um, social media uptake is increasing. And in the first five months of this year, the journal's tweets have had a reach of 70,000 impressions. Um, with the growing reputation, that's reflected in an increased number of submissions and of course, um, an increased rate of rejection. However, we also have a very strong diversity ethic. Uh, we've had submissions from 38 countries 
accepted articles from 19 countries across six continents. And, and of course, that highlights a major gap um, between the number of countries submitting and the number of acceptances from countries. And women um, overall to date represent 37% of our authorship of articles. Uh, however, we are um, committed to diversity in all its forms. We're looking to further reflect the interdisciplinarity and uh, geographical diversity, as well as gender balance, um, as we push forward. We have an all-female um, editorial team, quite unusually for a sort of cyber-ish security type of journal. Um, so what would be the tip for early career researchers in, in addition to, to the points raised by other speakers? Well, so I think most of our editorial time is spent on the somewhere in the middle articles. The bad ones get rejected very quickly uh, with desk rejects and so on, as other speakers have highlighted. And the good ones tend to really shine out. And it's, it's partly originality, partly really keeping a focus on who you're speaking to. This is a policy journal. Uh, a lot of our readers are practitioners in the field and they really want to have some help with coping with some of the emerging issues in the policy environment. So keeping that so what, what is my contribution, what is my voice and how does it fit within the range of views that are out there. Um, a good structure, strong analysis, really thinking about your conclusions and recommendations is really going to pay off. And also be selective about what you cover. Something that I see in early career scholars is it's uh, that you know, often it's a reworking of a PhD thesis and it's, it's really a kitchen sink type of approach where you've got everything in there. And our word limit for our longest articles is 8,000 words. So if you can't say it all within 8,000 words, think about refining and narrowing your focus so that you can go into more depth. And, and that way, make it a, um, accessible to a wide audience of policymakers who are international. That's another thing that we, we come across is people who are very deeply within their own field and forget what it was like before they learned all the jargon and understood all the, work, the frameworks of thinking. You're going to try to be engaging with people from different countries who might not be in your field because we are uh, cross-disciplinary in nature. Uh, literature reviews are a good, you know, this is something that comes through the peer review comments again and again and again, is articles failing to place themselves within the literature. Now you can really go overboard on this, but I think it does force you as an author to think, well, what's actually the, the prevailing winds in the scholarly environment? And that helps you to identify where your piece fills the gaps in the literature. Um, but also um, check calls for papers and special issues. We, because we have a very broad scope, unlike some of the other journals um, that you've heard from, we do a lot of focused special issues. And if you can fit your research into an un ongoing call for papers or special issue, then you're going to be aligning with the incentives of the editorial team and their focus and time pressures, which is to actually fill those special issues. And don't get downhearted, um, as others have said. The peer review process can be really harsh, especially if you're going through it for the first time. It tends to just focus on the weaknesses and flaws, a, a very commonly used word in peer review output, without actually remembering to say what was good about the piece. And it can feel quite brutalizing. It works best if you can sort of as Andrew said, put it to one side, calm down, and then go back to it later and view it as constructive feedback to help you improve the quality of your work and keep going. As everybody else has said, we're really happy to be contacted with ideas, early drafts, um, abstracts. We're very happy to engage. And lastly, some non-peer review ways in that you might consider, book reviews, 750 words or so, nice way of, of dipping your toes in the water. Be a peer reviewer, that's, um, that's, a, that's a way to, um, you know, just start to get to know 
the process, the editorial team, and see what sort of articles are coming through uh, the process. And also uh, a, a format that we've been experimenting with is interviews, because a lot of our authors are practitioners and they're not going to have the time or necessarily the patience to go through a full academic rigmarole of the peer review of the literature review and so on. So we do carry quite a few interviews. Check with the editorial team if you've got an idea for an interview, if you'd like to do one, uh, because that might well be uh, an early way in. So I'll leave it there and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Emily. Um, and fantastic advice there, I think, as well about uh, not being downhearted and um, dealing with the with the peer review process uh, healthily and effectively. Um, so uh, we've had five presentations now. We are running slightly behind time, uh, which which will take responsibility for there as the chair. Um, Martin Coward has very kindly. Um, volunteered to forego his presentation um, so we can move on to the Q&A um, and we can have the full half an hour participation um, with members. Um, so Martin uh, along with all of the other editors will be here for the Q&A. Um, so we'll move on to the Q&A now. I think people should be uh, broadly familiar with how the raise hand function works in the Zoom chat now. So if you have a question um, raise your hand um, and I will bring you into the conversation. Uh, and you can ask a question. So if you want to just put your hand up now, um, if somebody would like to kick us off, that'd be great. Just while people are thinking of questions, um, I, I actually have one um, for Ambrina um, <clears throat> on African affairs. Um, um, my, my question, I think, there is um, in terms of the over representation of certain areas. I mean, obviously, mm. as an area specific journal, as a continent specific journal, mm. um, I imagine that there are there must be areas um, and certain countries in particular which are really overrepresented. I work on South Africa, and my sense is that half the stuff in African journals is about South Africa. Yeah. So I wonder how you deal with that and whether sometimes. Um, articles pieces focusing on somewhere like south africa or a larger country are better off in specific in country specific journals uh, or whether you try and find a broader representation geographically that's that's a really important point so there are two things to say there one is that um i know because i write um almost exclusively exclusively these days on on kenya that one of the things we try and do and this was very much my experience of african affairs before i joined as editor um, is to talk to our authors about um, how, what wider um, lessons can be drawn from the paper other than just as a case study of South Africa or Kenya. So does it speak to broader theoretical debates? What's its wider contribution? And that often gets picked up by referees. Uh, but also, and, I, and I, this is something important to stress, um, we we go through the refereeing process, we accept a paper, but that really isn't the end of the story because the editors work very hard with you then on editing your paper further. So after it's been accepted, um, we, you can still go through what are effectively major revisions because the editors will say, can we push you on this conclusion? Can we push you on why you're speaking so narrowly just about a South African, um, uh, you know, effectively case study. Why, why are you not drawing out the wider lessons? And we think that your uh, paper would have so much more of a resonance and, and reach a wider readership if you try to speak to that wider issue of, of theoretical intervention. So that I think is a really important thing to say that we work with the authors right to the last until the paper's actually published to make sure that we, 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 um, we, we um, get our readers the widest possible readership for it. It's exactly Victoria's point that what we want for our readers is the best outcome. And we'll do that even after the, um, the, the reviews are, are in. 
um, but it is it is a really important point and of course um, we know that a lot of South African literature gets submitted because simply the 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 resources are greater there for doing scholarship than they might be in other parts of the continent so and that I suppose is one of the downsides of that kind of discussion I, I started with about fit so one of the things about fit is of course you've got to you've got to make sure your paper speaks to a journal but on the other hand that word fit is often used as a way of kind of policing uh, what is and what isn't suitable for a journal and so we try very hard to have the conversation particularly uh, amongst the editors about you know why why might we well my why might this paper not fit and is there anything the author could do to make it fit so that fit isn't just about you know engaging with and agreeing with all the previous debates that have ever been published by us but actually um, if you want to challenging them it's not about it's not about conforming but it is about um contributing something even if that's a, a significant theoretical challenge to the way in which uh, the journal has presented certain issues i think that's a really important point to, to make wonderful thank you um that's a really helpful answer we've got uh, a couple of questions in the chat box here so yeah um you can put your hand up or you can pop them in the chat box so from gabriella we have um a question i think this is a general question to to all of the editors do you have further advice for phd students adapting their chapters to a journal article i find that after so many years working on one long piece makes it difficult to streamline points into one standalone argument um i think that's a great question so if mm. anybody wants to come in on I'd be happy to answer that if that helps. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the thing with a PhD chapter is that it's in the, the midst of a PhD, right? So it's a building block and it's trying to establish itself within that broader thesis. Um, and with a standalone article, um, you're going to have to focus on a particular element of uh, your argument. You can't uh, reproduce the whole thesis in one tiny, um, you know, article so that's the first thing you're gonna to have to narrow down and, and sort of figure out which part of your um, analysis you want to highlight uh, either something that is connected to your PhD or might be something that you've developed alongside it that isn't going into the thesis whatever that might be but a chapter you know tends to have a sort of place in the thesis it's got something that comes before it something that comes after and so it's thinking about okay um you know i don't have that other scaffolding around this piece i've got to um put forward a, a sort of um particular um set of arguments that, that are about a very specific kind of topic for this article that i can uh, illustrate well and in sufficient depth in in the sort of space of the word limit of of a um journal article they are quite different sort of modes of writing and i know that's probably not a you know as an extensive answer as, as one might want but um it's something as well you know given that we've all said we need to be approached about um that i'm sure we'd be willing to kind of chat to people about if they had ideas for particular articles that were perhaps based on chapters we could maybe send some pointers um to approach an editor they would probably be able to do that but broadly that that's what i would say the difference the key difference is That's great, thank you. Um, does anybody else, uh, any of the other editors, have, have anything to say on that issue of um, streamlining a PhD piece into an article, or shall I move on to the next question? Um, if you've got on, anything else, I'll just come in. Yeah, I can. I, I can say something. I mean, um, it's a bit difficult. It's not what PhD students want to hear, but um, uh, so I've had about eight years of experience as an editor, first at Politics and now at Review of International Studies. Um, and it's generally my feeling that PhD chapters do not make good journal articles. Um, and um, I think, you know, I would uh, I would emphasize a lot of what Victoria said. Um, the point about a, a journal article is that it really needs to stand on its own and it needs to make an argument and it needs to show why that argument in some way advances a debate or starts a debate. Um, and chapters very rarely do that. You can sometimes put together uh, two or three chapters to do that. Um, but what you've got to make sure is that you're walking a really, really fine line. So 
on the one hand, you can't be in a PhD ch a chapter, you're often relying on the reader having read other parts, as Victoria said. Uh, you can't do that in a journal article. Um, and then the second thing is you've also got to make it clear what exactly is original about this. And that requires you to add um, a substantial amount. You can't just top and tail a chapter with an introduction and a conclusion. Um, and actually, you know, when I supervise students, we often think about articles as a separate activity to writing the PhD um, that can happen in parallel with and at different times but um, what you really want to think about is in the PhD project there are probably two or three things possibly less actually maybe two things that you really want to get out into the public uh, realm um, and you need to think about what those are who they matter to uh, and precisely what you want to say and then write those as articles and you can bring material in a little bit from the PhD although some universities have rules about not publishing before it gets uh, examined um, you can bring some of the material in but in general you'll end up writing something that's actually different can I add to that Tom please I think that's absolutely right actually from, from Martin that you need to see your PhD as something that you mine for fresh articles. There's lovely stuff there, lots of ideas and lots of empirical data and so on, but start afresh and use that as material for a fresh article that you start off with, with a journal in mind. It often helps to think about a journal in advance. Who am I, who would I really, really like to publish for this law journal or this Af Af African studies journal and then target them and write the article from fresh mining the stuff that you have which is such a richness I mean that PhD is going to carry you over you know in my experience a decade right so then you just use that material again and again in different ways for different journal pieces. Fantastic thank you very much those are really helpful answers and um, we have a question for Emily here in the chat uh, which is what do you mean uh, by policy in the journal of cyber policy context um, um, and and, and what are you talking about when we talk about cyber policy? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Good question, because cyber policy, um, there's lots of people in, in our environment who don't like the word cyber, and then putting it together with, with policy seems like some sort of, you know, camel type of um, outcome where um, ha what we wanted to do was to suggest a practical um, impact uh, in, in the articles and also differentiate between the sort of the heavy technical cyber security. It's not a technical journal, although we do have technical articles. Uh, we ask the authors to draw out the policy lessons. Our main um, readership, the, the readership we want to get to are policy makers. So if you think about it in that term, there are a lot of uh, policy makers who are trying to get to grips with the emerging issues from the online environment, from cyber technologies. And so anything that helps to make sense of these emerging issues and to give advice and recommendations is really um, uh, very much uh, appreciated. So I hope that um, goes some way to answering your question, but I'm very happy to take follow-ups if, if you'd like further clarification. Wonderful, thanks. Um, I'm going to skip to the the next question. There, sorry, I know that there was a second part to Joe's question, but we're we I want to kind of bring everybody into the discussion as much as possible. So there's a question for Martin here. Um, I think touching on what we've just talked about in terms of sending in an abstract of a study to make sure the fit and quality is right before sending in a manuscript. Um, yes, but. Um, so yes, uh, so I think there are a couple of things you need to, um, I think there are a couple of things that everybody should understand. The first thing I think you should understand is that um, with, ver with very few exceptions, editors um, are, do their job on top of uh, all their other academic work. I have a full-time academic load that's teaching admin and, and, and research, and I'm an editor on top of that. And when you consider that my journal has 300 submissions a year, I read all of them, I do the desk rejects, uh, and my co-editors uh, handle the peer review process. I also handle some peer review, but not all of it, obviously. Um, when, you think on, when you think about that, I, I, I definitely don't want to put people off, but I think you need to see it in context. 
So the first thing is, yes, absolutely. I'm more than happy and I regularly talk to people over email. You know, they send me something, they say, is this the kind of thing you'd be interested in? But I will invariably say it's hard to make a definitive judgment on the basis of an abstract. Um, you know, sometimes I read really great abstracts and the papers are not so compelling. Sometimes I read really terrible abstracts, uh, but then sometimes I see the paper later on and it was way more compelling than the abstract. So what I normally say is something like, I can give you general guidance um, about fit, uh, but I will normally say, uh, if you want a kind of more definitive judgment, then uh, submit it. Um, and the benefit would be, I mean, I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if you'd see it as a benefit, but um, uh, everything that we uh, read through the online system, even if we desk reject, uh, we give some feedback to uh, outlining why we've desk rejected it. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you'd get some kind of feedback like that, but yes, absolutely. Uh, in, in the kind of, uh, in the first place, feel free to drop me an email and I will, um, uh, I will get to it as, as quickly as I can. That's great. Thank you, Martin. Um, there's a bit of a discussion going on in the chat box about, um, the peer review process. Um, I won't sort of do this as a verbal question at the moment, because I think, um, there's a good discussion going on there. Um, so th we had a hand up, um, from, from Danielle. Um, if you're still there, Danielle, if you wanted to ask a question. Yes. Thank you. Um, I had a question. I think it's, it's mostly based off of something that Ted said, but I think it would probably also be directed at Martin Coward, um, as the editor of Riz. Um, Ted, you talked about um, interdisciplinary work is something that you're particularly interested in. Um, but one of the things I'm struggling with with a couple of pieces that I'm working on is how to position um, the argument that I'm trying to make because I am drawing on a lot of interdisciplinary work in terms of um, right now I'm working on a piece on geoengineering. Um, and most of the work on that is in cognate disciplines or in sciences. And what little work there is in international relations and international security says there's very little work on this in international relations and international security. So one of the things that I've struggled with is how to position um, the argument that I'm making um, in terms of who it's meant to be talking to. Um, because at this stage, the intervention is mostly saying the fields need to be focused on this and why are they not um, in international relations and international security. But I kind of worry because I'm trying to take on a few different fields and kind of explain what the positioning should be in international relations that I'm not really doing justice to any of them. Um, and I've, I've run into this before with other pieces that I've tried to work on, especially that draw a lot on history and historiography and its use in um, IR because you kind of wonder if you're talking to the people in IR that you want to, but also if you're really doing what you need to do to be fairly representative of the other fields that you're drawing from. So yeah, just some advice if you have any on how to do that interdisciplinary work effectively in an article piece. Mm. Um, I found it much easier in the PhD thesis than in a standalone article. Mm. This, if, if, I, if I may come in now, this is really interesting uh, discussion actually. And um, given your comments, I think you already have a pretty good idea. So if you think about the readership of a journal and you're very conscious of these kind of disciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, debates, uh, and you're very kind of forthright in explicitly discussing them when you're framing your paper, um, I think you will find that there is quite a demand for that kind of stuff. And certainly in, in my journal, European Journal of International Security, you know, some of the most interesting cutting edge research in the security studies field is no longer only in politics and international relations, but you know in computer sciences or in work on on technology or environmental sciences or or political geography um so very much open to that but at the same time we're conscious that our readership is mostly in the politics and international relations field so we would want 
the author to uh, walk us through the reasoning and walk us through the the framing um, in order to you know bridge those divide those divides and make a case for something that's interdisciplinary or or transdisciplinary. But when it can be done well, then you know you'll find um, it, it's uh, you know really really interesting and, and very successful. I mean, other journals probably go a lot further than EJIS. Uh, if you think about security dialogue, uh, for example, is the obvious um, example here. Um, but, uh, you know, as an association journal, we, we want to think about our readership, the membership of BISA, but also, you know, our, our global readership. But, but we would really encourage um, uh, submissions that are pushing the envelope in, in the kinds of ways that you are suggesting. Can, um, can I add something? Is that, is that okay? Um, so I think that's, that's uh, really good advice uh, there. I think um, one of the things I would say is never try and second guess reviewers uh, or journal editors. Um, in general, what we're looking for is really um, kind of thought provoking original um, work. And we're often really very open to what that might consi con con consist of. Uh, and um, unless the journal is uh, really quite niche, um, you know, we, we understand that the discipline is plural and has many kind of facets and so on and so forth. I mean, I think at, at, at RIS, um, we in general want to know what the significance of the argument is for international relations scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, we're not a geography journal, uh, we're not a law journal, uh, but we would be quite open to somebody bringing insights from, from those fields to, to international relations um, scholarship. Now, the thing I would say, and, and I think it's, it's bad to kind of think, well, you know, reviewers wouldn't be interested. Well, we wouldn't send it to deliberately hostile reviewers. That's, a, that's also some, not something that editors do. We, they don't send things out to, to reviewers who are going to be closed-minded about something. It would be a waste of time. You'd get some very poor reviews back. We'd send it to experts in the argument that you're making. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the key things to say, though, is um, often um, I end up desk rejecting articles that say we should pay attention to this argument because they then don't go on to say why and what benefits there are in paying attention to an argument. So it may be, for example, that international relations has ignored a particular insight from, let's say, cultural studies. Uh, that might be true, uh, and indeed it might be worth us paying attention to, but the article needs to explain what benefit there is to bringing that work into international relations scholarship, how it advances particular problems, makes us see them in a different light, gives us different tools, techniques, methodologies, whatever, something like that. Um, so that's the way I would think about it is, uh, you know, it's not just about kind of describing the intersection between fields. It's, it's about describing how when you get that intersection, it gives you something out. It gives scholars in international relations something that they didn't have before. Great. Thank you very much, um, both of you. That's fantastic. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat that, that, that haven't been um, addressed yet. Um, and they're both around the kind of issue of, um, publishing ahead of the PhD or during the PhD or expectations around that, um, whether that's advisable, in what context that's expected. Um, and I think this is something that might vary depending on where in the world you are. So if anybody's got any insights on that, that would be great. Um. I can, what I can say from international affairs, we publish pieces from master students all the way through to the most established senior professors in the field. You know, essentially we don't care who the authors are. Um, we're, we're concerned in terms of gender balance and in terms of diversity and that type of thing, but we don't actually care the standing of anybody. What we're interested in, I think most editors will say the same, is what the piece actually says. So if you're submitting a piece before you've done your PhD or haven't even started a PhD, but you've got something really original and interesting to say, we're interested. Um, if it's going to move the field on, that's fantastic. We'll, be, we'll bite your hand off for that. That's what, that's what, that's what we want. Um, but when you're thinking about your PhD and how, what you get out of it and overall publications, it's a, an overall calculation both in terms of what you, 
journal articles you might get out and also um, most people want to get a book out of it as well so when you're thinking about your PhD that's mainly going to be a book anyway um, that's probably the most obvious solution and then you're going to try and take bits from it or other bits that you didn't get into your PhD and use those as the basis for articles but I, I think most of us are quite happy to take things from pre-PhD people all the way through. Great. Um, any uh, any other insights on that from anybody else, or any um, more questions? Can I add something on that? Please, I, yeah. mean, I, I think it's it's possible, of course, to to publish papers at that early stage. But I would say that you do need to be careful about the use of that material. So you, you need to learn, I think, to guard your material, to look after it, to deepen it, to spend time with it, uh, and not to be rushing into publication um before you need to so a lot of the material that you might be um thinking of to put in a paper would actually be better used in your phd and of course the phd has got to reach its own level of originality as well so if you've got that stuff out there you could run into problems about you know to what extent is this new work so i would urge i would urge real caution about i mean i think you can get a, a distinct you know a, a discrete piece maybe published but I would be cautious about the overlap between any pieces that are done early on and your subsequent PhD work. I, I would have thought that your publishing career begins to gain momentum as you exit the PhD rather than being something that you do very early on in the PhD. That's certainly how I advise my, my cohort of PhD students. Um. I think we've got time for um, another question. If anybody wants to either pop anything in the chat or just unmute yourself um, and ask a question um, verbally, please do, um, because we've got a little bit of time. Or alternative. Oh, oh, yes. If I may, it's Emily here. Um, just one point that I think we've covered in our uh, very wide ranging remarks is is on um, you know originality in this in the sort of more technical uh, copyrighty sense um, most journals will be running uh, accepted articles through uh, plagiarism detectors and what's really disappointing is when those highlight um, highly highly similar passages in author's own previously published work and you've gone all the way through peer review acceptance you're all heavily invested in this article and then that comes up so do bear that in mind that's going to be part of the process and it's never really going to end up well because you're either going to have to do a major piece of rewriting or withdraw the article itself so uh, just uh, that's uh, another tip just on a very practical point about the process uh, and I'm sure that's the same in, uh, in other articles as well, although they may do the copyright check earlier on the process than we do. Uh, I think that's a really good point. We do it at the beginning and it'll get, it'll get you desk rejected. Um, uh, I mean, there are, and, and, and I would, if anybody is, I would say incorporating more than 10% of a previously published piece of work. Um, I mean, it's, it's always a bit kind of, flexible but if anybody's going to incorporate more than 10% of a previously published work in an article submitted to us uh, talk to me first because uh, we do it right at the beginning so this relates to the question about preprints doesn't it mm. in the chat yeah. box so when we see in I, I know in 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 a number of fields it's, it's very common uh, to put preprints on these websites um, but as I wrote in my response there in the chat box, this is much less common in, in politics, international relations and social sciences in, in general. Um, even though I think there is some dispute about whether a preprint is formally a publication or not. I, I think in some fields, in some of the natural sciences, um, they would argue it isn't. And it certainly does would not be regarded as you know, recycling your own work. So even though it would come up immediately on a plagiarism check, 
um, it, it, it wouldn't be a problem. But uh, I agree with you there, Martin. I think for, for our fields, it's much less common and um, could be a problem. I mean, most obviously, from a peer review point of view, you know, double blind review is really important. And if something has been disseminated already as a preprint, then um, it may be difficult to get it reviewed because we certainly have reviewers we approach who decline because they say, um, I've already reviewed this or I, I've seen something similar online. Yeah, so I agree, I, I would be quite careful of that. Sorry, um, yeah, um, I, I think that point about reviewers is really important. Sorry, I realised that I just threw that out and as with everything that academics say, there are a whole series of caveats that need to be made. Uh, it doesn't apply to your PhD in a repository, that's an obvious no. given, it has to be in a library. Um, it also doesn't apply to putting papers on, uh, on online for a conference. Um, and what would happen is it's, it's a similarity check and I would, I would, I, if a similarity check is above a particular amount, normally around 10%, we normally, tr we normally look and see. And if it's a conference or if it's a PhD, then um, obviously we can use discretion. Similarly with preprints, I'm not opposed to preprint. Uh, I'm not opposed to people um, putting them into uh, preprint repositories. I think that, uh, I think that uh, Ted's point about reviewers is the important one. You might find the reviewers decline to review, which is, which is a problem because you won't get the, the most uh, obvious choices for, for editors who are normally people that uh, are experts in the, in the field. Um, it's really when you reproduce something that's already been published in a journal uh, or in a book uh, that it becomes a problem. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, we are just about running out of time now, um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up because I'm aware that some people have to leave. Um, so thank you, first of all, to our editors who've agreed to um, be here today um, and give up your time to help everybody out. That's been fantastic. Thank you to all the participants. Um, I think people have found this really helpful. Um, so um, it's obviously been recorded, so we will be able to publish this and and um, and hopefully we can find some way to um, include the kind of text um, stuff as well because there's a lot of questions that have been answered in the um, in the chat box there so thank you everybody um, I hope we managed to get everybody's kinds of questions in I know we've been a bit pressed for time and we could talk about this stuff all day um, but I hope everybody's found it useful um, hopefully we will all be um, able to uh, reconnect with each other at one time or another in the future um, so Best of uh, luck over the next few weeks for everybody. Thank you very much um, and uh, have a good week, rest of your week. Cheers.